Jim. Um, I like Mary. <clears throat> I don't think there's trouble hearing. And I'm Greek. I can't stand still and can't keep my hands to my side. Um, and I appreciate your remarks because it provides you all with a context. Um, I overheard somebody go, what's FOIA? And, but that's, that's a good question um, because we use it all the time um, and most of us don't really know what it is or what the law actually requires. And so the Freedom of Information Act is FOIA and we've made verbs out of it. Have you been FOIA'd? Is it FOIA-able? Um, so that's the context, but thanks again, Mary. That was great context because I'm a realist. Um, you are public servants, you are part of the government, and maybe you've never thought of yourselves in that way. You're thinking, well, I'm just being a good citizen. Well, no, you have, when you accept an appointment to the library board, you have now become a part of the government. And the rules change. Um, and it's not something to be afraid of because you do have resources, the library, the FOIA council. Um, so, as a realist, I know that we will do what we're supposed to do if we just know what it is we're supposed to do. None of us have had, ever been trained in the Freedom of Information Act. I'm a lawyer. I didn't study FOIA when I was in law school. Um, it's a relatively new agency in the scope of government. It's a decade old. Um, but for those of you who've never heard of the FOIA Council, see, we don't even call it the Freedom of Information Advisory Council. We're the FOIA Council. And we're not the FOIA police. I can't make you do anything or punish you for doing something incorrectly. Um, but this is what we do. We were created to issue advisory opinions like the Attorney General's office. Um, their advisory, you cannot listen to us if you choose that course. Um, it's not probably the smartest thing you could do, but you know, it's your choice. This is America, you still have choice. Um, we publish educational materials, which you have in front of you, and I brought some additional handouts um, on how to charge for a FOIA request, because we get to charge people for the production of records that they request, as well as a handout on meetings, because as a library board, there's two sides of the Freedom of Information Act in Virginia. There's the open records portion and the open meetings portion. And the meetings portions apply to you and how you conduct your meetings. Um, and what is a meeting? And we'll talk about that as well today. And finally, um, we do training, and here I am, and we do it in two forms. We do what we call the road show. And um, we take it all around the state, and now it's every other year. And talk about FOIA, sometimes we have record retention parts of that presentation, but we also come to you. If you, anybody, I do about 77 FOIA presentations a year um, all around the state, it's free of charge, so if you want us to come up and talk to you guys about FOIA, we're more than happy to do it because that is our statutory charge. Um, so before we kind of get into the meat of it, we've got to take some big picture looks at the Freedom of Information Act. Um, we all, in government, and now some of you are like, wow, I'm government. Some of you may be like, that's pretty cool. Or others, you're like, I don't like that that much. I like just being a good citizen and participating. Well, you have crossed over, you know, welcome to our world. Um, we don't know what this law says, but we are not to be upset by that because, I gotta make sure I don't like the deer in the headlights on the thing. Um, the citizens that we serve don't know what this law is either. I'm sure lots of them will be like, what's FOIA? Um, okay? And the media that from time to time may cover you don't know what this law is. We all have perceptions. And as citizens, generally, we should be ashamed of ourselves, but not too much because nobody ever tells us what this is. We're just supposed to inherently know this. Well, no. It's, um, so that's what today is about. And like I said, I'm a realist. I will tell you what you need to do and suggestions of how to do it in a more constructive way because some of us still have hostility to the idea of what? They want my handwritten notes that I take in a meeting? They have a right to that? Well, these are my personal notes. Well, you're on our side of the line now. As government, there is no such thing as personal anything. All right? That's just the way it is. Those are the rules. But you have choice. Like I said, if you don't take notes, 
Because FOIA is about a snapshot in time. I want records that exist as of the moment I'm asking. So when you use email that relates to the transaction of your public business related to the libraries, you're creating public records. When you write notes down, you are creating public records. But your choice is, if you don't want to create a public record, then don't write it down. You know, I mean, it's like, and people are like, really, it's that simple? Yes, it is. Um, it really is. So, it's a law of access. And you all are access people, just in a different way. Access citizens to materials at the library and service by the library. But now you know you have this other. It's like you're riding the motorcycle of public libraries, and then your sidecar is the Freedom of Information Act, which is a different kind of access, which is kind of the behind the scenes access to what are you doing? What money of the publics are you spending? How much does this program cost, and why can't you improve that program? Um, so maybe think of it in that way. But it's the law that governs access. Virginia has its own law. Federal FOIA does not apply in Virginia. Federal FOIA relates to federal agencies. It's the right of access. And when you heard Mary say, well, you've got to produce a record in five days or respond in five days, you're like, geez, that's a pretty short period. There's no timeline under the federal FOIA and people are waiting 12 years for records they've asked for. So in comparison, five days, hmm, that's pretty good from a point of view of get it done and move on. And that's really the point of FOIA requests, not to terrify you, but we will talk about this in a little more detail. Now, government of mind for the people, right? Now I feel a little bit like Jay Leno. Excuse me, ma'am. What does government of mind for the people mean to you? And most of us are going, please don't call me. <laughs> please, I don't know. And again, we don't. We uphold this idea of government of by and for the people, and unfortunately, we don't know what it means. If you stop for a minute, we can go, okay, we elect people, okay, I got one. Then after that, I haven't had anybody go, well, Maria, I got number two for you. Never happens. If it is truly our government, then this is the everyday application. If it's truly ours, then this is how we actually exercise the right of being citizens and being the government all at the same time, right? And when you go, maybe you're going to the Capitol, well, I guess Sandy's at the Capitol. When you come in on Bank Street, the new entrance down below, it has a quote from Thomas Jefferson that people who are meant to be their own governors must be armed with the knowledge that, of information. And so the Attorney General, now the Governor, when they opened the Capitol said, Maria, were you responsible for getting that carved in marble? I'm like, yeah, Governor, I'm, that was me, not, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I gave him 25 cents and go, could you all like carve that up there? But that's the whole idea, that really FOIA is the everyday application of government <coughs> and for the people. They get to know what we're doing because they're bankrolling it. And when I say they, we're included in that, we bankroll it. I like the last two points. It's predictable behavior by government. That's a novel concept all by itself. <laughs> okay? And then it's procedures. How many procedures do you do a day related to your library board? Lots. This is just another procedure. This is nothing but procedural law. Okay? How soon do we have to respond? What form does that response have to take? That's all the FOIA requires from us. But the predictable behavior, unfortunately, people, <coughs> excuse me, have a pretty dim view of government. And I think that's unfortunate. Because speaking for Kim and myself, who are the rank and files, we work very hard to do the people's business. Um, let me ask him this. Are you doing it for the money? <laughs> <laughs> OK. And I ask everybody that. And nobody goes, oh, yeah, I'm doing it for the big drop down of big bread. Not. So we all have a public service bend. So it's being responsive. And so the dichotomy that's developed for us is as citizens, and we'll go through this drill a lot, as citizens, what do you expect from your government? Do you expect professionalism? Do you expect them to do what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it, and in the manner they're supposed to do it? And everybody's nodding, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, as the public official, 
What sort of service are you providing? Are you the one that goes, foya, shmoya? Go away, you bother me? You're irritating me, I got things to do? Now we have heard words, open government, transparency, we heard. Dr. Treadway mentioned transparency. And you could understand what, what she was saying with line items. You can see how that big pot of money is allocated. And in that context, we're all like, transparency, good. It lets us see and be able to go lobby the General Assembly and things like that. But when we say open government, government in the sunshine, most of us are like, please, Maria, come on, just get down to the brass tacks. It, they're just too abstract for us to really get our arms around. But I'm here to tell you that we are all the open government folks. Every single one of us in the United States of America. But it has to come real close to home before we have that moment that is, oh, right, I get it, the inherent value of open government. It isn't people being nosy and whatever negative attributes we give to the idea of FOIA requesters. Because let's just, citizens, let's look at it. In your locality, let's pretend that the school board in your jurisdiction is considering implementing a policy that will create a sex call in line in junior high school and it will be manned by the students themselves and the students will be excused from certain classes and they will receive credit. So your son or daughter is now coming home with a permission slip. Mommy, Daddy, I want to have sex talk with other kids in junior high school. Sign this, would you? And you're thinking, excuse me? What? What? Do you think, as a citizen, for the mere asking, whether that asking comes in an email, or you go down to the school board, or you send a letter, or you call them on the phone, and say, I want a copy of this proposed sex call in line. I want implementation plans. I want to find out about this. And the response you get is, we don't give that out. Why do you want it? That's none of your business. Or, I'm busy, I got other things to do. Anybody here satisfied as a citizen with that response? Too often as the public official, we're like, yeah, get away from us. What is that? <coughs> Open government. Let's take another example because you know, I'll beat you to death with examples. In your jurisdiction, they're gonna put a new landfill in. And for those of you who are fortunate enough to already have one, guess what, you're getting another one. Do you think that you should have the right for the mere asking, again, telephone, email, showing up, write them a letter, for the mere asking, and this landfill, by the way, is within a mile of your house, okay? Do you think you should be able to ask for records? Just a simple, I want to see records about this landfill. I want to know whether it's properly lined. I want to know hours of operation. Are they coming down those big trucks, coming down my street and you know dropping all the junk as they go? Do you think you should have that right? Yeah. And again, when they say, what do you want it for? What are you going to do with that? Is anybody happy as a citizen? What is that? Transparency. Okay, so have I made my point here? You've been beat to death about the head and shoulders with the, we are all the open government people, but it really, for us to embrace it, it has to kind of come home to roost with us, but it's a big picture thing. Okay, so and also in my opinion, it rehabilitates us to the public that we serve, because as I said earlier, they have a pretty dim view of government. And maybe they don't have a dim view of library board because they don't even know you exist. He said maybe for the patrons. And you know, there's not that's there's certain safety in that. But for the rank and files of us, they're like, we're a bunch of losers. You can't do it anywhere else, and we're in government because we're lazy slobs. And all we do is spend all of our day thinking about how to screw them over. Well, frankly, I can tell you, and speaking for Kim, it's just not happening. Okay? It's just not happening. So FOIA makes us responsive, which makes citizens go, wow. Government works for me. To me, that's where you want it to be. Okay, so uh, the good news is FOIA knows we're doing other things in government. 
So it's a balance between the right of access against the need of government to function. When you accept an appointment, you know, they told you, well, these are sort of your responsibilities. And then you actually started doing it and you found out about sort of the other duties as a sign thing. <laughs> and you found that well, I'm doing a whole lot more than what I really thought I was getting into at the beginning. Well, that's where FOIA is. So again, you're welcome to the government. Um, some of you have probably been in the government for a while. Um, but this comes with the territory. So FOIA is part of your job description. It's just written in an invisible ink if you even have such a thing. Okay? And sometimes we on the government side win in this balance. Now, the first thing we need to do is know what the heck a public record is, okay? Now, I usually ask people to close their eyes. <laughs> I'm a big risk taker. FOIA, first thing in the morning, closing your eyes, what are the chances that you will open those again? <laughs> um, but I want you to think about wherever it is that you do your public business, okay? What's on your desk? What's on those papers? What's in that laptop? What's saved to those CDs? What's in that file cabinet? And let me describe why you continue with this visual thing, what a public record is. It's anything, regardless of physical form or characteristic. It could be a map. It could be an audio tape, a videotape. It could be GIS. It could be databases. It could be your notes you're taking during meetings. Regardless of physical form or characters, we don't care what it looks like and how we store it, whether we stick it in a file cabinet or we stick it in a disk. Um, that we own, that we have prepared, or that's merely in our possession as it relates to the transaction of public business. Okay, and that's the important part as it relates to the transaction of public business. So now the question is, well, what's not a public record? Let me illustrate. This is not a public record. Okay? These, whatever the heck these are, are not public records. But basically, we trade in public records all the time. So the question in FOIA is not whether it's a public record, because it is, by this definition, in mere possession. What is that? We're talking about interfacing with vendors to get services. When the vendors give us financial balance sheets, they give us tons of information. Library patrons, when I go to get my library card, and I still got the card, I fill in a bunch of junk that you didn't have before. Voluntarily, now it's crossed the line to our side, the government side. It becomes a public record by definition. But the question is not whether it's a public record because under this definition, if we got it, however we got it, it's a public record. The right question is, does that public record have to be released? because FOIA in that balance recognizes there are lots of times government needs to hold it close to the vest. And that's what the exemptions are for. There's exemption for the identity of library pat patrons and coupled with what they're borrowing. It's privacy based. Privacy we protect we hold it close to the vest in the name of privacy, like Kim and I's personnel records. <coughs> our evaluations are public, are, are public records, but they don't have to be released. We're in the throes of contract negotiation. While we're negotiating, we don't have to give out the records related to the negotiating. Why? Because the public position will be damaged, right? In a bargaining situation. Litigation, if you're ever unfortunate, is anybody in the life, do library boards get sued? You ever heard of one? Well, okay. Or advice from your attorney. Mary talks to her attorney. They give you legal advice. You can withhold it. You don't have to give that out under FOIA. So the right question is not whether it's a public record. It is. It's does that public record have to be released? So FOIA comes from a point of view. Like I said, it's a snapshot in time. I want anything that exists as of the moment I'm asking. It does not go forward. FOIA requests only go here and backwards. They can go back 20 years, and we think, oh, geez, what a fishing expedition. Well, so what? 
we get to charge for our time away from the other part of our government job to produce those records for that requester. And the only thing a requester has to be is reasonably specific. And again, citizens, we want something from our government. Do we want to know, have to know who exactly to ask for that record in this organization? No, we want to just be able to ask. That's the only requirement, reasonable specificity. We, for us in the government, that's enough to know what to start looking for. Because as citizens, we don't want a high bar. And as my dad used to say, who struck John? <laughs> you know, about this. We don't have to know who exactly. Yeah, let's look at that. We call the school board and we get a receptionist or somebody and say, we want the sex call in line. And they're like, well, you need to talk to the right person and I'm not really the person. Click. Citizens, how are we feeling about that? Booey. Okay. So that's all. We in government have the distinct pleasure that only we can violate this law. Citizens can make us crazy, but they cannot violate the law. The media cannot violate this law. Only we can, okay? Because it goes, it's our sidecar. It goes with what we do. Okay, so now we know public record. So to the extent you send an email that says, or you get one from Kim that says, remember the workshop. Still a public record, and there's all the issues of whether it has to be retained and, and under the Public Records Act, which I try not to know anything about because FOIA is not a record retention statute. FOIA doesn't care if you got it or not. It just says if you got it, when the request comes in, you gotta go through this drill. But if somebody sends you an email that says, here's a funny cartoon, thought you'd enjoy it, or your spouse or significant other sends you, please pick up milk or get some dog food, cat food, not a public record. It doesn't relate to the transaction of public business. So what you do related to the library board at home, on your home computer, or in your office, in your other life, is still a public record if it relates to the transaction. We don't care the equipment you use. It's content. So if it relates to the transaction of you as a person at the library board, it's a public record, period. End of conversation. But like I said, there's 130 exemptions from release because FOIA comes from a place. It's if we got it on our side of the line, it's available for the asking. And our drill to give you nonverbal is FOIA is like baseball. When somebody makes a request, all records that are responsive to that request are on deck. And that's your obligation to search them out and bring them all. Then, to the extent the law, state or federal law, allows you to withhold some of that record, but only if you can cite the law, because that's required in your response, to cite the law. If you can't cite law, you can certainly call me. And that's what Alan and I do. 1,800 emails and phone calls a year, helping people figure out whether it's open, whatever. But if you cannot cite law that allows you to withhold it, it goes to the field of play. It advances to home plate, time to hit the ball. That's the simple drill. State or federal law, not my sense of fairness. I don't think that's fair that they should get that. Ew, I don't like that. <laughs> Unless the law is backing you up, what you like and don't like, unfortunately, with all due respect, doesn't count state for federal law. So if you need law, then talk to your legislator, talk to the FOIA Council. We have proposed exemptions to the law. Because when you look at everything you have related to the public business is a public record, and then you think 130 exemptions, that's maybe not even enough. When you realize everything that you touch related to the library board is a public record, Okay, so but that's the simple drill. If you can cite authority, state or federal law, because there's federal prohibitions about release on certain things, you can withhold that portion, but only that portion. Or sometimes the law allows us to withhold everything. But again, as citizens, the government is telling us, no, you're gonna get some, but not all, because some of it is exempt, or you're not getting any, because it's all protected. 
Now, as citizens, when government is saying no to us, they put it in writing and they cite their authority. Doesn't that make us go, okay, we can, you know, whether we like the no answer, but at least the government is not pulling this out of thin air or somewhere darker, okay? And that's the process. <coughs> as government is like, we got to write it, we got to cite authority. I mean, good Lord. Now, citizens, again, we understand. We get a letter. Responsiveness. Government says, you made this request. Some of these records are protected under this section of the code. And here's the rest of it. As citizens, we're like, okay, that's responsive. That seems, you know, professional. That's, they're doing what the law requires. Again, public official. What kind of public official are you? You know, hostility of this law doesn't get you anything except court. You know, that's your reward for hostility. Um, because this is the law, not guidelines, not regulations, state law. And no policy you can have at the library boards can override this. Now, let me give you just an example of, it's not our individual sense of fairness that controls here. I was FOIA'd at the FOIA Council. Now, wouldn't you think everything we have is like wide open? We sort of have to set the example. But I also work for the General Assembly and they have exemptions because they write the law as it relates to my drafting. And so it's confidential. I can't let anybody know that stuff. But on my FOIA thing, we do the road shows. Somebody made a request for the name and address of everybody who attended the road show one year. And I thought to myself, because I sound pretty convincing up here, don't I? I'm a true believer. Well, Maria's response was, what? Wait a minute, they didn't come to my road show to become a mailing list for you, right? I mean, that's sort of how we feel. And then I thought, okay, oh Maria, dear, what is the rule? Right, all responsive records on deck. It's a reasonably specific request. Mm-hmm, I know exactly what they want. Is there state or federal law that will allow me to protect this record? Now, who do you think would know that? <laughs> and I looked around just for the heck of it, you know, and I knew there wasn't. So what happened? That record went out. Okay, now, a couple points. First, that's what the law requires. So if there's no adequate protection, it's time to talk to your legislator or the FOIA Council. But the issue here is also the people who came sort of like this. Now you know, uh-oh, I'm just turned into a mailing list. <laughs> well, I saw the American flag out front. FOIA, part of the purpose of FOIA is grist for capitalism. That people make a million dollars on public records most of us in government are like, we hate that. No, you can't make a million. Why? This America, that they make a million dollars on, because public records are the only official record in town. They can be relied upon, generally. That they take it and make a million dollars means what? They hire people, which means everybody's paying more taxes, which means your state aid just went <laughs> And then people who are hired, can buy homes and participate in the American dream and we as a society move up one standard deviation. Now, why is that hateful? That's a good thing, okay? But also, everybody who came to the FOIA Roadshow put, they were government folks. They put their names and business addresses down. That's already in the public domain. I didn't give out anything that wasn't already public to start with, okay? Third point, maybe it's four, I don't count them very well. Yeah, we as government collect way too much. So now that you know this invisible line that is citizen side, government side, if we, we just suck in everything. We don't care whether we need it or not. It's just that's the way we've been doing it, and dag on it, we're going to continue doing it that way. And we suck it all in. Then all of a sudden, it turns magically into a public record. Well, if we don't suck it in in the first place, then we don't have this little fairness quandary going on. 
So think about the next time you look at forms or information that you require to be submitted to you, why are we doing it? Does it make sense? Is it essential to our mission? Does the law require us or authorize to us to collect this? And if it doesn't, don't. Because then you're never in the quandary of the over collection mode. So that's what we did. I didn't care what your name or address was, really frankly. We feed you at the Foyer Roadshow. So for 35 bucks, you know, come, you get breakfast, you get lunch. I just need to tell the caterer in Whitville, <laughs> there's 35 people gonna be here, make food for them. So that's what we did. We made a disclosure that said, put only that information that you don't mind being released under FOIA because these are public records. Give them the knowledge that I'm giving you stuff. What is its status? Is it protected? Because everybody somehow crazily, citizens think when they interface with government, that's all confidential. Uh, not ever, no, I mean, okay, rarely. Privacy is protected. There is no law that says there shall be privacy. The laws and context, privacy, borrowers' names and the material, they have to be connected. Borrowers' names could be material, but once they're connected, they're exempt from FOIA. Privacy is protected, again, our valuations, our leave balances, our training certifications. Privacy is protected in student records and medical records. There's no law that says thou shalt be private. All right, so disavow yourself of that notion. There's, it's in a context. The third or fourth, I do remember four, is do you really want government telling you or making a choice for you of who can contact you as a citizen? about that in a minute for a minute the person who asked for this mailing list was an archival software company in Arlington there are records people like the rest of us they're thinking hmm, I can there's people I can push product to I love America so I'm not interfering with his ability to contact you or your ability to respond to him so when he calls you and says, I have a product that will make your records management woes disappear, you as a big person can say, great, send a rep. Or you as a big person can go, no thank you. I have not made a choice for you. Okay, big picture stuff. One more example. The treasurer of the state is required, there's called the Unclaimed Property Act. So if you have money or bonds that you have forgotten about, <laughs> it's not real in my world, <laughs> it requires the holders of that money or bonds to report it to the treasurer so the treasurer can hook you back up to what you didn't know you had or forgot about. It's a pretty sweet deal. So the General Assembly said, treasurer, we want you to launch a website so citizens can put in their name and address and it'll kick up whether they have unclaimed property somewhere. And we're thinking, okay, that's pretty sweet. During General Assembly session, where are we? Yeah, over there. Um, there's a kiosk. You can go there while sessions. Find out where you have unclaimed property. I have not yet to have a hit. Like I said, it's not happening in my world. So somebody made a FOIA request to the treasurer that said, we want the database that supports that website. Is the database a public record? Prepared in the transaction of public business? Yeah. And they said, yeah, but all the people's privacy. Privacy, it's on the internet. You did it to them. What are you talking about privacy? And they're like, oh, okay, how about this then? Would you buy this? We, there's this industry that has developed called Air Finders, H-E-I-R, Air Finders. So they hook up people too. They found a way, again, God bless America, a way to make money on that we've forgotten about, we've got bonds or, and they said, but we don't want them contacting the citizens. And then they'll be mad at us because we did it. I said, remember, you've already put it on the internet. You've 
you've already done it in the name of public service and it's still fine because it's not your street address, it's Maria Everett, Richmond, Virginia. You know, it's not. And I said, again, government making a decision <coughs> who can call you? Don't you want to make the decision of how people interface with you based? Okay, we all get junk mail. My mom was just complaining. I got this right. Mom, we're all in the same boat. But so somebody from Airfinder calls me. Hey, Maria, I found, I went online and found out you had some unclaimed property for a small percentage of the value. I will hook you up. Maria can go, great, thank you. Or Maria can go, thanks for the info. I'll hook myself up. What's the harm? Things have happened the way they should. You got to make your call. I didn't do it for you. I'm not big brother. I didn't make the call, okay? So now, well, I don't know if I'm supposed, who I'm supposed to point to. Okay, these are the myths that we all, as human beings, suffer from FOIA. And they're all wrong, they're myths. FOIA requests, first of all, are requests for our records, not requests for information. To the extent somebody calls you and goes, why did you do that? Explain to me how the formula works. Not a FOIA request. It's about getting records. We're in public service, so we answer people. It's not FOIA. No timelines kick in. You can answer or not as you see fit. Okay, so it's about request for records. So to the extent they say, I want information about, and you're thinking, hmm, it's about records, not information. Well, it's called the Freedom of Information Act. So to the extent you understand bullet two, they want to look at or they want to receive copies, it's a FOIA request. Okay, and we'll talk more. The next learning module will be identifying when we've been FOIA. Okay? So the right of us as citizens <coughs> is to look at the record or to receive copies, but it's our choice. Again, in the sex calling line, we call up and say, I want to look at the proposed policy. And they say, no, no, no. We have to make a copy of that and mail it to you, and you'll be charged. Citizens, not happy. Public officials, yeah. Stay over here, even though you're over there. You're both places. It's called the big straddle, right? So the right is to inspect or copy the choice of the requester. Not free. FOIA requests are not free. We get to charge. And I, sorry to move on you like that. I'll just pass these around now. Take one. This is our charges document. It's called Taking the Shock Out of Charges. <laughs> I was floating down the Rivanna River when that inspired idea came to me. But it tells you how to charge for the production of a record. It even has a formula to figure out how much it costs to run a piece of paper <coughs> through a copier, because you need to know. You can't just, well, we as the board set a policy, it's 25 cents a page. Well, if that's not your actual cost, you may not charge it. Okay, so we gave you a formula. Because we're all about, at the FOIA Council, FOIA is formulaic. The better we know what we're supposed to do, we'll just do it and we'll move on. Okay? Yes? Could we just go back to inspect for a moment? Absolutely. Is there anything that, that prohibits a government from charging? If you say, I don't need a, a copy of the record, I just, as a citizen, I just need to go in and read it. I just right. want to see it. Um, I'm assuming the government cannot charge for that. <coughs> they can only charge for the copies if the citizen wants to take away a Actually, copy. Actually, you are incorrect. Huh. Well, because you, it, the charge is related to the production, and we'll talk about it in more detail. Search time, accessing the record, supplying the record, because there may be some redactions that have to be or are elected to be made. So we get to charge for that. And in an inspection situation, we just don't get to charge for duplicating because, so yes. Um, and I'm sorry, and thank you for the question. Um, I have a few, well, I don't wanna call them rules, but first is, this is FOIA, first thing in the morning. You all know where the caffeine is, so feel free to go get it. And you will not bother me if you need to get up, just move your arms. Again, I will not be insulted, I get it. Number three, 
feel free to ask any question at any time, secure in the knowledge. There is no such thing as a stupid FOIA question. Again, 1,800 emails and phone calls a year. I have yet to hang up the phone and go, my word, what an idiot, okay? <laughs> this can be a tough law. So either I've thrown the gauntlet down for you to find out a stupid question, but believe me, I haven't had one yet in 10 years, okay? So feel free to ask them. So yes, we'll talk about that in a little more detail. It relates to the production of that record. We get to charge, but it is not revenue generation now that we're waning budgets, thinking, ha, we need a new color collating stapling copier at the library, and we're gonna get it one FOIA request at a time. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> okay, it's cost recovery. Again, God bless the Commonwealth, the pay-as-you-go state. Most states don't allow any charges for FOIA requests. On the theory is, if you never, I mean, Mary said she got one or two FOIA requests a year. There are agencies that get one or two an hour. So, you know, your world is pretty okay. But many states don't allow for charge because you're gonna get paid your salary as a government voter whether a FOIA request comes your way or not. But Virginia recognizes in that balance that you were appointed to do certain things. And the time it takes you away from the performance of that, you can recover the charge, okay? It's not a sword, it's just recovery, again, okay? Now, FOIA doesn't prohibit the release of anything. It's like, what? What I mean by that is you can never say, I can't give that to you under the Freedom of Information Act. That sounds backwards anyway. What FOIA says is, again, government, we recognize that you need to hold it close to the vest. But there's a process by which you do that. Cite your law, put it in writing. But government, if you want to, you can release every single record you have under the Freedom of Information Act. So the borrower records connected to the materials, the who and what, you can release it if you want to. There's no law prohibiting <coughs> it. FOIA just says you don't have to versus you must. Now there are other laws out there outside of FOIA that say thou shalt not release. There, we have a tax secrecy law in the Commonwealth that says local tax officials and finance people cannot release tax returns and financial information, you know, gross receipts, any kind of tax information on any person, firm, or corporation. And if they do, they go to jail. Social service records are tend to be, you can't give those out. If somebody makes a request, the response is, I cannot, those records are confidential under this section of the code. But the exemptions found in, so any of those thou shalt not statutes trump FOIA. You have no discretion to give it out or re, retain it. <clears throat> but in FOIA, if somebody made a FOIA request for um, your resume, because people have a dim view of public officials, as I said, and they think that an appointment to the library board, what the governing body does is goes up to somebody sleeping on the park bench and goes, Excuse me, sir, would you like to be on the library board for the locality? Now, is that really the way it happens? No. But somebody says, I think you're hiring your cousins, you know, people who aren't qualified, whatever, and I want a copy of all the resumes. Those are personnel records, records containing information about identifiable individuals. It's privacy based. We can say, no, you don't get to see their, their resumes. Uh, because they're considered personnel records. Or you can say, here, look at that. They have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to perform this task. Who knew? So that's the discretion you have in FOIA to release in your discretion. And there are times that you may just want to, and that's a good example of it. But again, if you choose, but what I'm saying is FOIA doesn't say you can't give it out. It says you don't have to give it out. But if you want to, you can, unless there's another law that prohibits the release. And we can tell you what those are too. Because there's no penalty. We in government are afraid. I can. We are afraid of making a mistake. Well, you can't make a mistake when the law gives you discretion to release it or not. The only mistake you can make is if there's law that prohibits the release. 
I don't know of anything in the library world that prohibits the release of a record. Um, but if you come up against that one, call me and I'll certainly research it. Finally, there's no such thing as a formal or informal FOIA request. To the extent you understand I want to look at, I want to receive a copy, it's FOIA. Okay, that's a FOIA request. The newspapers usually mess this up. They make a request, we blow them off, and then they get arms akimbo. What? I don't have to make a formal FOIA request over this. They already have the first time. Okay? Which leads us into the shock of shocking. FOIA requests do not have to be in writing, nor do they have to say the magic word FOIA. Am I like right in your sight line to the screen? A bit. I can back up. Let me grab this. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't even think about that. So am I blocking anybody now? You're good? Okay. They don't have to put it in writing or say the magic word. I want to look at records. Done. It's a FOIA request. So this is our next module. What the heck is a FOIA request? Anytime. Telephone. Email. At least that's in writing. They can show up at the office, at the library. That's why it's really important that the rank and file at the library understand at least basic things about this law. If somebody's making a record request that they have this response that says, so-and-so is responsible for that, this is her number, or I'll connect you, or you'll need to contact the chairman of the library board, and here's the, but the deer in the headlights, um, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, the person, the first person they meet coming in needs to be able to articulate something other than, I, I don't think we give that out. Um, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Again, citizens, what's our impression of government when we come in there and ask a question of all places in a library to the reference librarian who goes, I don't think we give that out. And our friends in the press, when they do a press audit every so often, um, they go around to library boards and they go to sheriffs, they go to state and local government, everybody in government in Virginia, and ask for records that have to be released, no questions asked. And they write it down. Who's, and they always characterize, I don't know what you're talking about, I don't think we, or there'll be a charge for that as a no response. I have told them that is not a no response, that they need to quantify their little survey more, you know. Um, but, and not that we should be afraid of the press, but the press audit in 1999 that led to the creation of the FOIA Council, Virginia's compliance rate in government was 16% with this law. Um, the point was made, right? I'm an optimist. 16%, we're in double digits, woo-hoo, in Virginia. <laughs> a lot of other states, 8%, 9%. There was an AP audit that was done in 2006. We are at 50% now compliance, which is certainly a huge improvement. But, okay, as the gambling public, you betting on a 50-50 odds? I know, most of you play the lottery. Well, <laughs> those aren't even that good. But 50-50 is still not good. It's a hit or miss, and that's why we're all about traveling the circuit and talking about this law because it is the big picture <coughs> um, democratic republic. It's how the business of government and citizenry all intersect. And so a lot of us think, get all myopic in the topic we're about, but think about how is it that this interface between citizens and government, and that is FOIA. Okay, yes ma'am. Um, back to charges partly because they can be a stumbling block right. for some citizens. Um, and, and we've all had the experience of going to Google and putting in a term, and suddenly there are five million responses. I mean, literally, right. there can be, if usually it's fewer, but often you're deluged with requests. As, let us say that a citizen comes up and says, I want to FOIA this, but I'm afraid it'll cost me too much money and I'll go to jail because you'll bring me, you know, a whole room full of records and say that'll be $5,200,000, ma'am, and if you don't pay it, you'll go to jail. So that they, it could intimidate citizens who might be afraid that they will get way more than they thought they were 
expecting. Right. So how does that work? I mean, there's no such thing as, as an informal FOIA request, but what about the citizen who says, if this doesn't cost too much, I want right. this information. Can you give me an estimate of how much I'm going to get back if I ask for this? Right. Is there any provision for that kind of Absolutely. an exchange? Right. The issue here is still one of choice. You don't have to charge. Boy, didn't say you must charge in recovering your cost. You can not charge. I mean, people are walking into offices now. I've heard people, and every example I give you, I'm not making this up. This is questions that have come to me. First, they bring in their copier paper and say, I don't want to pay a charge. Can I run my paper through? And so, like you, you perceive these people can't afford this. So your choice is, as a good human being, to go, you know, okay, we got tight budget times, fine. You can have it free, keep your paper. Now people are bringing in portable copying machines. And it was a State Board of Election who called me and said, we've got to let them run it through their copier, don't we, Moran? I'm like, uh-uh. <laughs> you can if you want, but I'm sort of, again, that realist saying, you're going to plug something into my electric thing and I don't know where that's been or how much coffee's been poured down the throat of it and you're gonna plug that in and blow up the building? I don't think so. But what you should hear it as, I don't wanna pay the charge. So be a good human being and don't charge them. Because they've already paid for it anyway. When you stop to think about it, because in that brochure the first question is, how many times does the public have to pay for this? They're paying for you to be here today, aren't they? They're paying for me to be here today. They paid for me to prepare this and for you to look at it. They, they paid for these tables. They paid, they. We all paid for this building. We've already put our money in. So it's a good question. And number two point, communication is key here. It's not this sort of paper, let's talk to them. Because you know the job I do now. Do you know what records I have? Not really. You can make an educated guess. Same thing, I know what you all do. And I can kind of guess what kind of records. But I don't know either. And we're all insiders. And people on the outside, you know, government is this big wall. And they don't understand state and local authorities. And they don't know. So talk to them. Which I think leads to the next slide, which is, I hope. <laughs> uh, well, we'll go back to this, but I want to get to this one. Motive immaterial. It's not a need to know all. I live here. I have a right to know in my jurisdiction, in your jurisdiction, anywhere. Because I'm bankrolling government. Do they have to be a citizen? Yes, we'll go back. Well, we'll talk about that too. <laughs> Everything is a little fluid in the FOIA world, okay? But that's where we can help them. We've already acknowledged we don't really know what we each have in terms of records. So as an outsider making a FOIA request, they have no clue. So why you can't say, why do you want it? What are you going to do with it? You can say, these are the types of records we have. What are you interested in? Help them. And then they say, because it's efficient for you, and it will be efficient for them. And the biggest bonus is they walk out going, wow, government works for me. And government starts getting restored to a proper place of respect. That's my opinion. You'll hear me say it. I'm sorry. I couldn't believe it. Help them. Because it's, FOIA is a strange law in terms of what's efficient for us ends up being efficient for them. And it's a win-win. And there are not many things in life that can be win-win. So talk to them about these are the types of records. They'll tell you what they want. Most of them aren't going to be too cagey, though they're the conspiracy theorists out there, and you're never going to get them to pinpoint, and they're going to pay a lot of money, and that's just the way that goes. Because nothing makes a requester more reasonably specific as finding out how much production of records actually cost. And they usually go, oh, maybe 20 years is too much. Maybe five years will do me just fine. So have a discussion and say, because they have a right to ask for an estimate. We don't have to give them one. But if they ask for it, we have to give them an estimate. But it's like, the other thing FOIA does not require, we don't have to create records that don't exist. As I said, it's a snapshot of things that exist as of the moment and backwards. 
nor do we have to abstract or summarize from our own records. If they make a request that says, how many people participated in a child's reading program that are now um, participating in an adult program? Well, if we have that record that we've done that cross-pollination, we have to produce it. But our obligation is not, we don't have to produce column A, column B, and tell you what the answer is. What we have to do is gather all the responsive records and say, here's column A, and here's column B. You figure it out. We can if we want to, but always do it with the consent of the requester, because for the conspiracy theorists out there, if you abstract thinking you're being a good FOIA doobie, right, they want to see the original record, and now you're hiding something. Even if the original record has nothing but black marks all over it except two words, that's what they want to see. So if you think you're helping them out by abstracting and it'd be cheaper for them, they're going to get mad at you. So don't abstract or summarize until you tell them, well, well I'm happy to pull this, these data elements out. Because most people, not the conspiracy theorists, think that they want five data elements and that somehow there's a record that gives them that. Well, we in the government world know there are like 40 sheets of paper that tell that story. But our obligation is to get them all together and produce those records. And if you want to abstract or summarize, communicate that. So communication is key in the FOIA world. It can help you get it done quicker and also serve to um, help the citizen in reducing the charge. Or like I said, you don't have to charge them at all. No requirement, thou must pay, no. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to the, who can make FOIA requests in Virginia? Citizens of the Commonwealth and media that broadcast in or out of Virginia or have um, circulation in Virginia. And then after we finish this, we'll take a break. That seems about the right time. Who qualifies you as a citizen of Virginia? You live here. Just that. It's, again, like reasonable specificity, it's not a high bar. If we don't, if you lived here and you used to live here, but you still own property and spend send tax money into the state, I think you have FOIA rights. You know, again, as citizens, <laughs> I'm paying for that piece of property in Albemarle County and I'm making a FOIA request. Now, what happens then when we're looking at out-of-state people? The way this works is out-of-state people cannot sue us for a violation of FOIA. Only these people can at the moment, right? They can bring us to court if we fail to follow any of the procedures that the law dictates. How to say people can't. Doesn't mean the law, or I guess a polite way of saying that is the law doesn't apply to them. So without a state people, if what they want your record bad enough and you tell them you're not a citizen, <laughs> they're gonna call their Virginia buddy who is then gonna make that same FOIA request for them. You can do this once, you can do this twice. It's your choice. So with out-of-state people, at the current time, to me, is work the deal. Because knowing they're probably coming back. So, because the rules of five days, of written response, charges, and it's the charging that gets us with the out-of-state people. It's like, well, we're tightened up. I mean, how are we gonna reproduce 400 sheets and you know, we're losing money here? And the citizens of Virginia shouldn't have to pay because somebody in Iowa is not gonna pay. Well, out of state people, you can get prepayment. You're like, in my opinion, is that it's like, okay, you want six months worth of board minutes or whatever, we can produce that with, within a reasonable time, like within the next month, but that'll be $89 and you gotta prepay before we even start. Done, you got a deal. They can't sue you for violation, and you're under no timeline at all. That's the constructive way to deal with out-of-state requesters. Certainly, at this moment, you can tell them you don't live here, or you don't have circulation. UVA tried this. Wall Street Journal made a FOIA request. And UVA called me and said, but Maria, they have a worldwide circulation of millions, and it's only 13,852 in Virginia. And I said, well, it's kind of like being pregnant now, isn't it? Um, you either have circulation or you don't. So they're in. What was the deal here, boys and girls? 
And I said, and how much resource and time did you expend figuring out the Virginia circulation of the Wall Street Journal? I mean, it's an approach. This is an approach to this law. To me, my latest model is a bakery. Serve up the donuts, and next, that's what FOIA is it. Deliver it, don't deliver it, next. It's not to get all mired in it. What do you want in it? What do you want to do with it? Oh my God, it's like, you're busy. Get it done, move on. That's really what the law wants us to do. And plus, just that mentality improves our image to the citizens. Now, isn't that a funny thing? That's what the law means. Yes? One of the interesting <coughs> things about the person that we deal with on a regular basis is that he is homeless. And we don't know whether he lives in the state of Virginia or not. And, you know, even if he said he did, it doesn't necessarily mean he does, you know? Well, my favorite FOIA requester is um, in Central State. So, you know, we, it, it doesn't matter. I'm like, you want to know you're interested in your government? I'm going to reward that interest. Um, How much of a break, Tim? Let's do about 10 minutes, a little bit shorter. 10, okay, eight minutes. <laughs> okay, and um, I'll be here if you have questions or, you know, see you back. <coughs> For anybody who happens to be an attorney in the group, um, there has to be two, and I don't know if I count or not, but you get CLE credit and I have the CLE form. So if anybody's an attorney, and would like to get 1.5 hours of <laughs> CLE credit, come see me and I'll give you the form. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, we have a situation in our county where some citizens um, had their computers subpoenaed. Mm -hmm. or, um, they did a petition for get some more supervisors. And, you know, it's a huge thing in Boston. I want to know. Oh, yeah, Gloucester County, Dr. Report. Yes, you did. Over again. Um, I know. So, could our <coughs> computers, I was secretary for a couple of years on the board, on the trustees, could my computer be subpoenaed at some point because I did get it some emails? And the answer is uh huh. Mm -hmm. Because subpoena is a whole different, that's a court process, that's not FOIA. So anything in the world is subject to subpoena. Correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Subpoena is a different. That's the judge or saying produce these records. But it's because of the public records on my computer. Well, it's involved in a case. Uh, it's the lawsuit that drives the subpoena, not. Right. I mean, some people. Yeah. So, so FOIA couldn't. When somebody requested for FOIA, couldn't request. Do we need to backtrack on what a public record is? I mean, because that's what you said, a public record, anything that's written down. So if I'm doing a minute. No, 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 you misunderstood. Databases, <coughs> audio tapes, videotapes, CDs, anything. Stuff in your computer is a public record, regardless of physical form, character, it's not written, it's not handwritten notes. But FOIA, it would not be a reasonably specific request to say, I want the contents, the hard drive of your it would just laptop. Be yeah, it would be, I want records that relate to board minutes, that relate to you know the landfill. It has to be reasonably specific. I would say a request for your hard drive of your, you know, the contents of your hard drive. Um, and your local networks is not a reasonably specific request under FOIA. Okay. But to say I want all emails that you sent or received between this time period is a reasonably specific request. All, me all emails specific to your trustee business. Well, right. Not your bit, your whatever you do in your citizen side, but related <coughs> to trustee business. Exactly. Good point. Could something like that be transferred on a flash drive and then taken to a library computer so that any of her material would be removed? Yeah, and, then and that's one of our handouts is email use and retention, which is the suggestion of how to organize yourself because if you're doing this from home, if you're not creating discrete electronic folders 
to help you organize that when somebody makes a FOIA request for all emails related to library board business, if you just have them in the general file, you're, I mean, it's gonna take you a long time. And again, the charge side of that is you can charge your actual cost, but it has to be reasonable. Is it reasonable that you don't organize your emails and that the citizen has to pay more because you have to look through 6,000 emails? Exactly, that's one of our suggestions is create discrete electronic folders. I took my own advice in 2005, right? I gotta move back, right? So you can see. Um, and I said, correspondence 2005. Everything went in it. And I went, okay, this is not discrete. <laughs> All right, I need agenda materials. I need FOIA FYIs, because some people write some hideous letters to government officials and back and forth. And they just FYI, you know, CC the FOIA council. Um, so I don't have to do anything about them, but I have to store, you know, put them. Or it, as you suggest, do it on a thumb drive and or make um, whoever is the board, the staff person at the library who is, puts out the notice and does the minutes and all that, CC them on every piece of correspondence related library business and make them the custodian and then you don't have to work. Then they know if a FOIA request comes in, they got it all. These are suggestions, or print it to paper. And a lot of technology people, I'm happy to hear, we're all familiar with, we love paper in our world, right? A lot of technology people are like, oh, Maria, quit saying print it to paper. <laughs> but if it's paper, we know exactly what to do with it. We know where it exactly gets placed. And that's what we do when you email us, and we have, or we get phone records, I write them down. And before I hit send on my response to you, I print it because IT people cannot control what you keep and what you don't keep. And they try. Oh, our servers are clogged. You've got to clean out your email. Well, there's the Virginia Public Records Act administered by the Library of Virginia that says how long you have to keep stuff. So there, again, FOIA is not the retention statute, but the, the Public Records Act is, is that thou shalt keep well, the rule is, thou shalt not destroy public records. FOIA doesn't care if you hit delete on purpose or by mistake. FOIA is about, does it exist when I ask for it? Now, the Public Records Act will care if you go, I don't care, I'm getting rid of this one. <laughs> and the only rules I know about the Public Records Act, like I said, I'm trying not to know much about it at all, is the higher monkey muck you are, the longer you have to keep it. And I would contend that everybody in this room is a relatively high mucky muck. Because you're an appointed person and so your retention schedule is long and much higher than others. I'm the executive director of a state agency. Ha ha, me and Alan, that's the state agency. <laughs> but I have a pretty long retention period because allegedly I'm a high mucky muck. And you can yes, check yes. your retention schedules on the Library of Virginia's website. See, there's this method. You know, and I wish more citizens could participate in workshops like this because their first question would be like, when do you ever do what you were like either employed or appointed to do? You're so busy like giving records out, retaining records, organizing yourselves. It's true, government, this is the hot seat. This is not easy over here in our world. Okay, you had a question. I had a question. What about churches? Do they come under this act? Churches do not. I didn't make it clear, and thank you for the question. FOIA applies to government, state, local, authority. If you have like a PSA, a public service authority, it applies to them. Um, it's all about government, getting records from government. And FOIA defines as a public body is our term. Any organization, agency, or corporation located in Virginia wholly or principally supported by public funds. So traditional government, state or local, is covered by FOIA. But how about area agencies on aging, local economic development organizations? They receive a big fat chunk, mostly all, <coughs> of public money. Then FOIA says, you know what? Because the public is funding this, you have a right to see their records too, as it relates to the public money that they get. Question I saw. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Are you going to talk about these um, closed meeting exemptions? Yes. Okay, then I will. 
Okay. Well, I mean, it's all fair game. If you want to ask now, yeah. okay. Yes, sir. Uh, two quick questions. Okay. Uh, items in draft format. Mm -hmm. You have this consultant come in and do this thing, and then an item stays in draft and never gets a final version approved. Right. I'm sure it's foyable, but there's plausible deniability that you're not following that, correct? <laughs> uh, <laughs> the question is, what about drafts? You know, it's not the final thing. Is that still a public record? And the answer is, yeah, it's still, we don't care what form along the process is. You know, for retention purposes, it's the final approved thing and versions, but, you know, plausible deniability or not, it's a public record if somebody asks for it, it you go through the same drill. It's a reasonably, it's a responsive record, and to the extent the law would allow you to withhold it, you can. The same rules apply um, <laughs> to the official version versus a draft copy. But then we don't like releasing draft anything because it, people do take what we say and go to the bank. So the best thing we can do, you can't deny it on the basis this is draft and it's not final. Whether it's a minute or a document you're working on, Again, whatever exemptions would allow you to withhold the final version would allow you to withhold the draft. But the fact that it's a draft doesn't change. It's not withholdable on that basis. Now, what can we do constructively? Because we don't like, I mean, I don't like it either. I write an annual report for the FOIA Council every year. I've had a FOIA request for, I want a copy of your, you know, what you're working on. And I'm like, but I'm not done. And again, see, I have to remind myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there it goes. But what I do is I stamp it draft. I actually write a letter and say, <laughs> I watermark it. I'm like, you can't rely on this. This is just something I'm working on. It's not the final version of anything. And that's all we can do. That's really all you can do. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to show my computer illiteracy. Hey, can we hit delete a lot? And does it not really delete? <laughs> she said in the, how, in the Howard Hall's <laughs> library of administratively necessary if you're CC'd or BCC'd you can dump it. After that, it's a retention thing. You gotta keep it for a set number of years and the schedules online tell you how long you have to keep it. And when you get rid of it, you have to send us a signed thing saying we have gotten rid of these records per this retention schedule. Attention and disposition. Well, gone to government. <laughs> this, is, this is just records. It's, it's not a list of possible board members. I can keep that for a long time. Even though it's just a. Okay. <laughs> All right. Can you, okay. that, can you repeat that question for her? Okay. She asked whether if she, if she has a list of potential board members that somebody has sent her, does she have to keep that? And the chances are yes. Any correspondence with document that I'm going back and forth on email, I do exactly what she said, I put it out next to the file. That's my original, that becomes the master document, then I can delete the email. Okay. So, um, and then if somebody asks me, what was the conversation on your rental agreement for such and such a building, bang, here's the file, I'm done. But, um, but you don't delete it without making sure you have some I have a copy. copy. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. But it's, it's a little right? This all becomes easier and more organized. Yeah. The revelation here is that everything we touch, whatever form it is that relates to your library board business, is a public record. This is the Friends? Friends of the Library too? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Correspondence between Friends and, like, you know. Does it relate to the transaction of the public business that relates to the library board? Yep. And the answer is an unqualified, yes. uh-huh. That's why I have two email accounts. I have my business email account and I have my Gmail account. So anybody who corresponds with me in my personal life, it goes to my Gmail. I don't conduct any business on my Gmail account. So, uh, so you say. <laughs> As a general rule. Hey, if somebody sends me something to my That's business, what you need to do. 
We really do. Does the law require it? No. But that way, when a FOIA request comes, he's like, I go here. I don't have to like sort through a bunch. It doesn't. It doesn't become a burden. It's like I know where it is. It's right here. And that's what you have to do. You have to. It's not required under the law. But again, the better organized. Yeah, it's a best practice. Keep your business, and that's the last thing we say in our email handout is keep business, business, keep personal, personal. Because those are even, those are public records you're creating. When you take notes during the meetings, you're creating a public record. Like I said, cops a lot are like, well, be, these are the chief's personal notes. There are no personal notes in the FOIA world. What you take at a meeting, what you're taking now, belong to the public. But the thing is, they have to ask for it. FOIA doesn't require us to put anything out there. It's all triggered because the citizens have a responsibility to ask. We don't have to do anything until they ask for it. <coughs> okay? And so the other thing about email is we become less professional. <laughs> Yo, what's up? <laughs> and then we chit chat. Well, email has made us incredibly lazy. I mean, at least you guys aren't in a, a government office house there, right? You just come in and meet and then, but for the rest of us, there are people in the library that are on the same floor that don't even get off their chair to walk down the hall to have a conversation with somebody. They send them an email. And so what email is, is there's no visual cues, right? So what we tend to do in our email is provide the visual cues. Hey, what's up, Mary? Good to see you. I really like that shirt. Where'd you get it? Hey, you know, I'm kind of tired today because I stayed up late watching Monday Night Football. By the way, who won? I don't even know. You know, I can't stay up then. I'm like, I wake up and discover I'm asleep and then I go to bed. But I write, I'm tired. I watch Monday Night Football. Oh, by the way, Mary, do you have the the stats for the friends of the library, do you have the list of who, whatever. And then you go to, I'm hoping to get out of here early tonight because I want to go to a baseball game. Chit, chat, chit, chat. So now you have a full page email that you have created now, all by your own self. Somebody makes a FOIA request for that report. This is a responsive record. Now, because the first paragraph is chit chat, you could redact it all. The last paragraph is chit chat. And now what have you really done? <laughs> you have a full page email. The first paragraph is blacked out. The last paragraph, there are two sentences that relate to the public business. To the conspiracy theorists. <laughs> to the newspapers. Look what these bums in government are doing. They're wasting the public's money by chit chat. They don't ever get down to the public business. <coughs> don't set yourself up. Because no one else chit chats in any other business. Right, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> ever. Sure. Well, here's the fun. The consequence, exactly, the consequence of choice of using email means you're creating a public record. Maybe some of that can come out of that record, but if it's in the transaction public business, Unless you have an exemption in law, it stays in. So don't create it. Again, I'm pretty convincing up here, right? What about we have Facebook on our library? It has a Facebook page. So public talking. Yeah, it's in the public domain. We're kind of talking to each other about social media because do you retain copies? Are you required to retain copies? You know, because FOIA looks at, well, are you required to retain it? But even so that then if it's there while the request is made, somebody could make it. Yeah, I mean, there's all these versions of things now in today's world. So I sent an email to the director of the Department of Professional Occupational Regulation, DPOR for short, does the barbers, boxers, real estate agents, all those guys. And he used to be on my committee, so I wrote, Dear Former DeBoer, AKA Head Honcho, what's up, man? And then I went right into my business. I got an immediate response, Dear Miss Everett. And I was like, oh, 
<laughs> it happens. It ha so think about it. I'm about the public business. How do I want to represent myself and the library board? And you spell check. In my line of work, I do administration and government. I write law. I write the FOIA law. And that word public, <laughs> I write it a hundred oh, times. In the end. <laughs> And spell check will not pick up that other word that gets in there. Right, right. So anymore, I put Peabody, you know, P wrestling. I just don't even go there, you know. It, right. It's again, how do you want to represent to the public? The qualified, the professional people that we are. Yes, ma'am. I am a not so high Mahima. I serve on a library advisory board. We have no power except to advise library officials and the board of supervisors. Right. Does a lower standard apply to an advisory board? On retention? I don't know the answer to that. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Under FOIA, yeah, I'm not a retention guy person. This I don't is, know. I don't I'll know. find out. Anything. But but you are a public body, you get that part. Even if it's just advisory, you're still a public body for the purposes of FOIA. Okay, last short point on citizenship. There was a federal case, Delaware said citizens of Delaware, somebody in New York made a FOIA request in Delaware, they said person sued in federal court. Federal court said, Delaware, your law is unconstitutional on the privileges and immunities not fair, FOIA is the big government of life for the people thing. You can't discriminate in state or out of state. So, the access advocates in Virginia, and this is not a threat or anything to scare you, are looking for their first test case. So the next time you get an out of state requester, think to yourself, how hard is it for me to say, money up front please and I'll get it to you in a month or so, versus Let's see, let my locality be first test case for the constitutionality of this FOIA provision. Which one would you pick? <laughs> yeah, it's like number one. Again, not threatening, just, you know, it's an approach, boys and girls. Get it done, next, right? It's the bakery, take a number, go. Okay, and for our difficult people, a little practical advice. We all got our lovely FOIA requesters that just hearing their names, or hearing their voice on the phone makes us just get all naughty. I ask this every time for 10 years, 77 times a year, okay? Can anybody tell me that they've waited out a FOIA requester long enough or angered them to such an extent that they went away? Look around. You see a hand up? Never has been a hand up. So, the simple rule is it does not work. It puts you in violation of the law. The law says failure to follow procedures that we tell you five days to respond, send a letter when it's required, only charge your actual cost, which also must be reasonable. You violate any of those, they can sue us. And what happens is FOIA dockets are within seven days. The judge has to hear it. I mean, Again, the big picture law, this is a big, important, it's the interface of citizens to their government. They don't have to prove anything. All they have to do is, I allege my FOIA rights were violated because I made a FOIA request and I never heard from them. And again, as citizens, anybody happy with that kind of response from government? No. The judge, the burden of proof is on the government to prove that we did it correctly, that we responded. That's why it makes us write a letter, because it's CYA. We got this letter, Your Honor. We just won. But if we don't, we just ignore them because we don't like them. Clearly, your counsel will advise you not to say that in open court. <laughs> then you lose the case. And then you, the person who sued you to make you do the right thing, is entitled to recover their attorney's fees and costs. You heard Dr. Treadway, you all don't have any money. I don't get any money. And now you're gonna pay somebody who probably you didn't like to start with for mistakes that you made? Does that make sense to anybody in this room? No. So let's do 
and we have an 800 number in the back of that green brochure is our website address our 800 number you can call us a million times a day if you want to is there a circuit court judge that it goes to or general district it can go to general district or circuit it has to be within seven days of the first five days of the no 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 if they sue you that when they file their FOIA petition, the oh, judge has to hear it okay. in five days. So we'll not get mired down in the legal. Okay. Any pushing and nothing that okay. All right, this is the procedure. Five working days. No Saturday, Sundays count. No legal holidays. And you count day one as the day after you get the request. Okay? So we get a FOIA request on Friday, and let's pretend Monday's a holiday. Day one is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Next Monday is day five. Okay, a little bit of a nod to government. Okay, to produce the records or make some other response. And so this is the procedure that I was saying failure to follow is deemed a violation. Okay, here are the responses. Sure, here they are. Uh, we need more time. No, you're gonna get some of the records, but not all or no, you're not getting any of these records because they're all exempt, or we can't find them, or we're not the custodian, okay? Even though no is two separate answers, no in part, no totally. So think double nickels. Five days to respond, five responses to choose from. To the extent that it, there's an issue in your locality with your library board and people are making a bunch of FOIA requests, unlikely but if it happens prepare yourself know what's coming and just make copies now and so when people come in you go here here and they get that like wow government's working for me again damn I'm mad um and you're done next or put it to a website Point it, like I said is upon request but if enough people you know the conspiracy theorists get all involved then tell them we're gonna post it to a website and we'll update it and you and your crazy friends can download it all you want you know speaking of websites if you do have stuff on a website and somebody makes a FOIA request for stuff that's on the website and you say well it's on our website are you done well maybe right if you're done you're done if they say great thanks a lot I'll go to it but if they say no I want my own copy the drill begins okay I hear go ahead say he says I just write him a letter anyway it's on the way you know Here's under the this if you need more help please let me know <laughs> and see and I and I you're um, somebody who's in my camp which is I write every any letter that you write to a citizen in relation to a FOIA request, write it that you're writing it to the judge. And does that sound like a cooperative government trying to help people kind of request? So when you have to prove you did it right, Your Honor, I wrote him a letter and said, here it is, and if you need any, you said that you didn't, that was fine with you, but if upon further reflection, please contact me again. Are you gonna win that case? Yeah, you are. So don't write a, a load of guff, <laughs> you know? And email, again, <laughs> sometimes people hack us off. And we just get to that email and we start writing, as the library board, we're writing attitude back in that email. Stop. Read it on the front page of the newspaper tomorrow. And if you like how it's gonna read, then push send. And if you don't, just vent and let it go. Because this is a law that says how we need to act not how we need to feel. So don't get caught up in the emotional part because especially with difficult people, deal with them promptly. FOIA says, shall promptly respond in no event more than five days. So the crankier they are, get it done now and get them gone. It is counterproductive to try to wait them out because we've all acknowledged that doesn't do anything. And then they're gonna sue us and guess what? They're gonna win because we got all emotional into it. We don't like you, we're not gonna do this. You bother us, go away. They don't go away. That's just the beauty of it. They do not. So deal with them constructively and move on. Okay? Yes, here it is. Requires no letter. Here are the records you requested. And it's you've got to respond to them by the close of business on the fifth working day. And that may mean you have to produce those records if there's no exemptions. 
But some of the other responses, all the other responses require a letter. And you can respond in email. If the request comes to you in email, you can respond in email. We have written every response letter for you already. It's on our website. Is there any reason now to violate this law? Not in my opinion. We already wrote the letter, and if you need us to help fill in the blanks, we'll do that for you too. We want government restored to a rightful, respectful concern for citizen position. And it's pretty easy, and it's like we said, CYA. If they do sue you, you have the letter the law required you to write. Done. Case over. Yes, ma'am. Could we have maybe a couple of real life cases of things that people have had to respond? Okay. Mary, you've had the FOIA request. Um, we had a situation where we had a family that was challenging our confidentiality uh, policy in regard to a ch children's, how they sign up for library cards. And it created a lot of angst in the community. And we were FOIA for not only all the minutes and that kind of thing, but all of the notes that were taken during the uh, meeting by anybody, any of the board members, any of their emails that w went back and forth um, that weren't part of the meeting or anything along that line. We were FOIA for, um, they wanted copies of all of the responses to our RFP for our integrated library system and had to provide that. These were notebooks this thick. Did you charge them? No, because we actually had extra copies. Then you get ahead. It's its own reward, isn't it, Mary? It is. All right, anybody else with an example that they've been FOIA about? We had a, a one recent last last year. Was somebody did researching something to do with Comcast, and it was an attorney, local attorney, wanted to see our Comcast records. And I was like, okay, here's our latest bill. Scanned it, photocopied, sent it to his assistant. Done. Yeah, it's it really that's it's an approach, and some of what I've said and what you learned today is maybe like whoa, eye opening. And like you, I drop everything and get it done that afternoon. Absolutely, and, right. yeah, yeah, because it's, it's they're not going away. They're not no, going away. they're not. That is the one thing that <laughs> will never happen. They will not. Like my guy used to say, I can't fix, break my head to fix yours. Well, and believe me, if they FOIA you, they know the rules behind FOIA. They know everything yeah. that has to do with FOIA. Mm -hmm. And probably they've already called me first. <laughs> and I told them if they didn't already know it. And so I, I even had a board member FOIA us and contacted them first. Didn't talk to me, contacted them first. Yeah, and we try to smell out a rat, but there's really nothing, you know, we apply good faith to whoever calls us. But, you know, as library board members or boards, assume, they have no greater FOIA rights than any other citizen. So sometimes they, you know, they're a little bit control freaks and they want to exert their authority and mm -hmm. make you do something. It's the same FOIA drill for them. You know, there may be some political reality that you want to face in that. But under FOIA, they're citizens like the rest of us. We used to have uh, our local newspaper used to come to every meeting, but they don't anymore. All right. Well, in the meeting side, and we'll get to that at, uh, my, what time? I have 11.25, is that right? Yeah, and like, we're gonna go through a couple more of this, talk about charges, and then, um, wow. so the record, so everything requires except yes. So to the extent a record has parts that are exempt, it doesn't mean the whole record comes off. It means that portion of that record. We're all about portion control in our daily lives, right? <laughs> this is yet another, it's about portions that are exempt. You can't put a black mark on a piece of paper unless state or federal law allows you to. And the rest goes out, okay? So that answer, you're gonna get some, but not all because it's exempt as patron and material borrowed information or it's contract negotiations that are <coughs> happening right now, they're exempt under that exemption. Um, so you're not getting any or it's portions, okay? Then um, the records don't exist. 
Again, somebody wants five data elements, and you didn't create a record that just has that, but you have all the pieces, parts. You gotta pull the pieces, parts together and produce them. Sometimes they're asking the wrong agency for it. You're not the custodian. You're not required to keep those records, so, but you have to notify them. We don't have those records, but the regional library does, and I suggest you contact them. You have an obligation to notify them. Again, as citizens, when you want to know, and this, this last one came in relatively um, recently because somebody called the FOIA council and said, I made a FOIA request, and I never heard back from the locality. So I called the locality because I try to do small m mediation and say, what gives? You know you have an obligation. And they said, well, those records don't exist. And I said, well, why didn't you communicate that to the requester? And they said, because the law doesn't require us to communicate that to the requester. Citizens, what are we thinking about that? <laughs> so now we have a law that says you need to respond to the citizens. In case you didn't already know it, if you don't have it, I mean, come on. It's an approach, it's an approach. And see, this gentleman is smiling because he's figured it out and it's easy, relatively. And that's kind of what we need to do, is stop going hostility, hostility, this makes me crazy. It's like, okay, how do I solve my own problem? Because if it's efficient for us, it will be efficient for the requester. And again, that context, I don't have the records, yeah. but I know who does. I know the city clerk has them. Right. So I'll refer the person to the city clerk, and I'll call the city clerk and say, hey, I got this person, they're coming over to you, you might want to get these records right. Right. And she appreciates it, Patrons Next, go on down the road. right? Yep. It's uh, did your job, help the citizens out. Wouldn't that be the way you wanted to be treated? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, my sister sent me this. This is. <laughs> well, man, this I mean, hey, when have you ever seen a FOIA cartoon? It says your FOIA request has been rejected and your dog is cast out. Now, I have three dogs. I'm not happy about the cast out part, but there are people I feel like doing that too. But this goes to feel any way you want. If you hate everybody in your locality, I don't care. The law doesn't <laughs> care. But do the right thing, what the law requires. Again, it tells us what we need to do, not how we need to feel. All right? And if you want to copy this, put it on your wall for your favorite requester. Let, let me know. How about <laughs> discarding the records? If I've done my due diligence and I've got somebody's asking me for records I no longer have, but I've been following a library of Virginia schedule of mm -hmm. removal of documents. I say I don't have it. Do I then have to back it up with the forms that I sent to you all that said I got rid of these documents? Or can I just point them to it and say, I'm following my thing? Yeah, your, your FOIA response is those records don't exist because I destroyed them in accordance with retention schedule under this section of the Code of Virginia. That's yeah. That's your FOIA response. Now, you know, they're like, prove it, I want, and then they say, I want your D, D, Dispositions. Yeah, there's three, whatever it is. <laughs> RM3. RM3. I want your RM3. Okay, then FOIA, you got to produce that. I guess there's a schedule for that, too. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a how you have to destroy it. Oh, yeah. Thrown in trash sometimes just is not good enough. If it's got sensitive information, it's got to get so. shredded. Burn, bury, shred, bury. That's the one that. Bury? Really? Yes. Really? There's a bury clause. Like bury yes. in the landfill? That's always funny at the little backyard. program they do. You have to follow the garbage truck to the, the, yeah. the, oh, the right. yard because and watch them. You have to have documents. You, you have to watch them bury it. <laughs> well, but if you're the citizen, <laughs> that's our punishment. The boatload of personal information, <laughs> you want to make sure it got into the bottom you of the You ask your, your friend's advisory board to buy you a shredder <laughs> so you don't have right. to go. Ask the friends for shredders and then everything gets you. At the right time, get no, shredded. We have the shredding service that comes once a month and we offer it to patients who want to shred their. What's your locality? Um, Hopewell, Prince George, and Italy. Wow. That's region. very progressive of you guys. Okay. We all become good students, stewards of the public money at the time it comes to charge people. All right? We're not cost recovery, remember, not revenue generation. So you can charge for this. The law says you can charge for your actual cost. Re you can assess a reasonable charge for your actual cost. So you got reasonable and actual in the same sentence, which means you can never charge more than it actually costs you, 
But even the charges that you do have to be reasonable under the circumstance. Okay? And people will sue you over charges, believe you me, <laughs> without a doubt. I'm going, okay, let's go citizens. We want a copy of the sex polling. Sure, you can have it. Here's copies. That'll be $87. Ooh, $87? But it's only two sheets of paper. Oh, well, you know, we're really busy and we had to figure out our fringe benefits and, you know, we had to stand at the copier and we charge it for the time the person stand at the copier and we had to walk down the hall and talk about it and we had to have our attorney look at it. <coughs> Citizens, what are we thinking about that? Not too much, but as the public official, yeah, let's get them. <laughs> Stop it. Damon and Fisher. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. All right, and if time weren't limited, we'd go into that. So your actual cost in government, think about it. It's tremendous. We own the buildings. We own the tables, the air conditioning, the heat light, the projectors, the chairs. What am I talking about? We, the people. And again, how many times do the people have to pay for it? So what you can actually charge is out of this tremendous actual cost that we do have in government, you charge about this much, which is the time it takes to search for that record, accessing it. If it's in a database and you got to do a parameter search, it's not creating a new record. It's because it's a computer. It can shoot out what you need. It's supplying the record to the extent the time it takes to redact that record, or if you mail it to them, the postage. You can charge. Duplicating, but you need to know what it costs. And like I said, you have a formula that takes into account toner, electricity, and paper. You gotta know what it costs to run a piece of paper through a copier. And so, as your question was, if somebody wants to inspect, you still have to get it all the way to right before duplicating, and you can charge for that. Now, FOIA says you have a duty for safekeeping of your records. Now, say you have somebody sit in the room with the person who's reviewing the records. Can you charge their time? Kind of depends. If the person there is doing something like this, I'm kind of getting hungry. It's lunchtime soon. Do you think you're charging for that time? Would that be reasonable under the circumstances? Citizens. <coughs> well, we had to charge you because we had to put somebody in the room. And you got the hourly rate because it took you three hours. So you paid $65 for them to stand there. Anybody as a citizen happy with that one? Now. The person in the room saying, ma'am, here are some stick of notes. Please mark anything you have a question about or you want a copy of, or if you see another document referenced in those materials, I'll be glad to get that for you. Can you charge for that? Yeah. So again. All right. Now, FOIA. All right, this is, I've already said it. The hourly rate of the person. As we know, uh, that's why staff, the Lord made the staff. And that's what they do. But you as library board members or advisory board may have to go through your own stuff if you don't um, CC actual staff people. No fringe benefits. Stop it. Yes, it's an actual cost. But it's not one that you can recover. Okay? It's an administrative act. This is not rocket science. You don't have really any prohibitions on release that I'm aware of, which you would have to be worried about. And finally, you have to be reasonable. The state veterinarian did a FOIA request. He did it himself, the state veterinarian. Charged out the request at his hundred, the hourly rate at his $100,000 a year salary. <laughs> Actual cost, uh-huh. Reasonable, citizens, what say we? We're already paying your salary, what? Reasonable. So if the way you store it is crazy, if you're not this gentleman right here, then you need to talk to him. And if it's all a mess and it takes you, well, it took me 40 hours to go through all my emails, that might be actual cost. But is it reasonable to pass it on to the requester because you're disorganized? I don't think so. And all you professional people here that, well, I want it at my rate that I get in my real job. Oh, no, you never. That's not happening either, okay? Now, there's a magic number in FOIA. More than $200, we get money up front. 
I bet. But it's got to be whoops, more than $200. So we anticipate it to be $10,000. And Falls Church, they got a FOIA request for all the emails and BCC and CC copies and backup of all the um, city council members yeah. and everything. It's good. That's good. Ten grand. First they called me and was like, this isn't reasonably specific. And I'm like, it's all the emails between named parties for a period of time. It's just going to be really expensive. And so I called the requester and I said, you really got 10 grand for this? And plus, what the locality can do is we anticipate that to be $10,000. And they don't have to do anything. The clock stops running until the money shows up in your hand. Yes, ma'am. Are you saying if you give uh, public records out, you charge that much money? Well, you can charge what it costs you. So but you, in you this charge, example... You can charge an hourly rate? Yes. Or you can charge up to $200? You can charge more than that. Well, it's what it costs. It costs. Well, what are you basing the cost on? You're basing the cost on... Time it takes to search, the time it takes to access, which to me is a computer, kind of getting it out of the computer, supplying the record, redacting it where the law allows you or if you mail it to them, and the cost of duplication if they're getting copies. Ooh, that's that's a it. Lot of money. It can be. So when in our example, somebody wants all the emails between all the city council members, including CC and BCC for a particular time period, it's tremendous. It costs ten thousand dollars. They estimated, and so what happened? They provided. A, they had. They well, they talked to me. I talked them down to one month. Mm -hmm. I said, I called the requester and I said, Do you really have ten grand to pay for a FOIA request? And they said, But if I tell them what I really want, then they'll destroy that record. <laughs> okay, right, got that. And I said, Well, what you suspect to be true will be in one month's worth. So why don't you save yourself some money? And he was like, oh, that's a good idea. You know, <laughs> conspiracy theories. What are you going to do? God love them. Did they produce it in paper, or did they send them an electronic copy? Um, I think they, s I don't really know. I don't either. That, that's my jurisdiction. It yes. Has, it had to do with counsel. And, um, right. So. And who actually does the physical work? The secretary? Does Usually. The yeah, because yeah, a, a lot of it, it depends um, who actually deals with it day to day, but it really is an administrative act because the high monkey monks aren't going to the basement. I mean, that's just a <laughs> fact. <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> right, right. The state veterinarian was being a good guy, but he overcharged. So it's the hourly rate, and it really is an administrative act. Because again, most of the records in our world are not prohibited from being released. So you can't make a mistake. So at $200, we have to give them the estimate. Still, the five days applies. You got to get that estimate within that five working days to say it's $600, it'll be whatever, depending how long back they want those records. And some people think, I'll be a good FOIA doobie and I'll start working on it now. And then the requester comes and narrows the request because they don't want to pay $800. And you've already done some of the work and now you want to be paid. You're not going to get paid. Don't do it. Yes, ma'am. When that patient uh, requested information from you, did you charge him for that? No. Okay. No. That's My not. central state FOIA requester. I don't charge him. I mean, he's in central state. Come on. <laughs> um, if you are charging less than 200 can you get it in advance or only 200 more? Question is, if it's 150 bucks, can you get advance payment? Only out-of-state people. <laughs> yeah. No, it's 200 is the magic number. So let's look at that. Somebody makes a FOIA request and they want all the board minutes for the last 20 years. Okay, fine. Cha-ching, cha-ching. You know, search time. Accessing it, getting the records in front of them, running through a copier, ends up being <clears throat> remarkably only $185. They show up to pick them up, and they say, I'm really sorry, I forgot my checkbook. What do you do? 
No, no, no. <laughs> Wrong answer. I'm sorry. See, that's when we're like, oh, heck no, you're not getting these records for free. Back up. I'll charge you rent of $15. Back up, bad dog. Back up, bad dog. <laughs> what are we? Well, see, you all don't know this. But what are we good at in government? called billing and collections. So what you say is, citizen, it isn't a problem. Because you have all the originals. What do you want the cops for, right? <laughs> and here's your bill for the $187. Fine, give them a bill. Let them walk out. Make document storage their problem, not yours. Because what FOIA says is that anybody more than 30 days in arrears of a charge for FOIA the next time, because those are the ones who make the second request, you don't have to do it. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so like please that. bill yes. them, because that's yes. shoe number one. Okay? FOIA, like I said, the balance is, you know, if you're not paying your FOIA bill, then don't come back, hit me. Now, you can always do more for them if you want, but you can say no, Mr. Requester, so give them a bill. That triggers everything. And if you think you're not going to recover that money, think again. Because in law school, we used to say, the right hand doesn't get you, then the left hand will. And you know, well, the times that you do vouchers, that like today, you're traveling, you put your social security number on that voucher. Why do you think you do that? I always thought it was crazy, because it was like, I work here. Don't you already know my social security number? And then I thought it was a fictitious pay kind of issue, that we're not putting in false vouchers. Oh, no, no. There's called the Debt Offset Act in Virginia. So if I owe money to the Commonwealth, they're running my Social Security number, the same as yours, against this database, against if you owe the Commonwealth money, your voucher will be reduced by the amount, hopefully only reduced, by the amount of money you owe the state. <laughs> if the right hand don't get you, then the left hand will. <laughs> so those of you that think you're not going to recover this bill that you gave, you need to think again. So give them the bill. You cannot say you can't have these. Again, you cannot have these. What do you look like? <laughs> Loser. Let's not go there. OK? Meetings in our remaining, well, we did start it. Five minutes, whatever. OK, in the meetings world, and I have a meetings um, in, oh, good, you have them. For you on the library boards, this law, the meeting side of FOIA applies only to you. It doesn't apply to the rank and file. It's deliberative bodies, the library board, the school board, the board of supervisors, the city council, advisory boards, commissions, the FOIA council, general assembly committees, planning commissions, deliberative bodies, whether they're advisory or not. And this is the true integrity and in government component. And the learning modules in the meeting world is what the heck is a meeting? To know when we're actually having one. And you thought, well, kind of already know that. Mm, let me explain. How many people on library boards? Depends. Odd numbers, 579, something like that. The rule in FOIA under the definition of a meeting is any time the library board sits together physically, because that's all you can do. No teleconferencing, by the way. Mm -hmm. Are you allowed to, if you have a member who's missing a conference, call them in from a remote location? There is, and I didn't bring that handout. It's like on the day of the meeting, you're sick, or your child's sick, or you get a business meeting. You can call in, and the board can vote to allow you to participate fully. You're counted as present, but it requires them because it's always this dude always calls in and can't make it for some reason. Or if you're sick, there's an, a medical emergency too. It's, or not even a medical emergency. You're confined. You have some loathsome disease. You're in the hospital. They don't want to disenfranchise people. So you can call in, but there's no approval. because. But it has to be reflected. They called in because they claimed under the medical contingency or the emergency. Under the emergency, the nature of the emergency has to be revealed in the minutes where the medical condition, you don't have to say they have boils on their feet or whatever it is, you know. Um, but that's the only exception. No teleconferencing, no conference calls for you guys at the local level, period, end of conversation. None. No email. 
Um, no email, meetings. No email hoax. No, 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 never. Nothing electronically for you ever for voting, for discussion, because we had a Supreme Court case out of Fredericksburg that they had a meeting by email. And yes, email are records, but they can be meetings too. And you're not allowed to do anything electronically in terms of meetings, vote. Everybody has to vote in open session, period. But let's identify what a meeting is. The library board meets. That's a meeting. Okay, we're all getting good with that. But then the law drops down to an informal gathering of as many as three or more and the discussion of the library board business. It is a meeting. So when you accept an appointment, it's like you got a tattoo across your forehead that is not visible until three or more and the discussion, then your tattoo not only shows, but it starts beeping. Now let's look at how that happens. This isn't so much for the public because the procedural rules under FOIA, if it's a meeting, require notice to the public. And your clerks take care of that. You don't even have to worry about it. Open to the public and minutes. That's the procedures, okay? Three or more is to protect you because do you ever have minority people on your boards? those pesky minority people that are never happy with anything. Well, three or more of them cannot meet and discuss the library board business without the rest of the board knowing. It's like a few smiles on faces like, oh, that's kind of cool. So it protects you as the board. So, yes, ma'am. What about a lunch meeting between the officers of the board? Between the officers, are they also board members? Are there three of them there? Yes. Are you discussing board business? Yes. Beep, beep, beep. You're having a meeting. Three, the informal assemblage of three or more and the discussion. So FOIA again gives you choice. <coughs> Keep your numbers down. Disclosure though, you have to tell the rest of the board what you do? Yeah, you have to give notice. In the parking lot after a meeting. Yes, okay. I was so offended first time I got on the board and you know there was two of us talk two people talking and then I came up and they said sorry can't do that and I'm right like, whoa, okay whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> well and and that's it anytime so it's the right number and the right discussion you need both so if three or more of you gather and talking about the price of produce it's not a meeting but you all talk shop I work for the General Assembly, trying to tell elected or appointed people to keep their mouth shut. Guess what? It ain't happening in the real world. So FOIA gives you the choice. Keep your numbers down. Two or more, we call it the Noah's Ark rule. Two or more can meet of the same library board, can meet and discuss library board business till the cows come home. It doesn't have to be public. It doesn't, nobody has to know about it. Because it's that need of government to function two by two. Two by two, that's it. Unless you have a subcommittee and your subcommittee has three people on it, two is a quorum. The Noah's Ark rule just stopped. So make your subcommittees, if you have them, a little bit bigger so that the one-on-one -on -one can occur. That gives you the ability to talk, that's why. Now let's look at this rule of three or more. I mean, anywhere it happens, you could all go to the same church and if after the service you go out and get some coffee and three of you sitting there talking about library board business beep 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 shut your mouth you're in the grocery store oh hey we're on the library board let's talk hey i'm really concerned about beep 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 shut your mouth okay i mean that's where the rules are now do you ever come early to a meeting how many of you stand there talking to the staff about what? The agenda. You're having a meeting. Three or more discussing the public business. So a lot of times meetings are happening we're not even aware. So that's what today my job is to let you know when you're, and like you said, do you ever stay late and talk, do the same thing or walk out three together, post mortem, you know that word, what you just did in the parking lot? Meeting, there was no notice given. It wasn't open to the public. And then they try this on me. 
But Maria, there were three of us, but I didn't say a word. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Your response tells me everything I need. Because usually I go, citizens, really, are we buying? You're in the presence of the discussion. So two by two. Sometimes you get called to people's meetings that aren't yours. You know, do you ever have um, people invite you as the library board to some other function? Your, your open meeting requirements follow you wherever you go. So when they go, and the clerk is always saying, well, how many of you are gonna go? If all you're gonna go, I gotta give notice. If three or more of you are gonna go, and do you think at these functions they're inviting you because they like the clothes you wear? They're inviting you, why? Because you're on the library board. So what do you think they're gonna talk about? The public business. But notice, notice fixes everything. The library board is going to attend a meeting of the, the book, the, a legislative event. right, a legislative event, the Appomattox <clears throat> County Book Club. Just give notice. It's done. And it has to be open to the public. So if three of the board members from my county had come here today, we would have, that would be. And discuss, but public? I think you're not discussing, because remember, okay. it requires both the right number and the right discussion. We're not talking about library board business here today. So it's not a public meeting. But if you go to library associations, whatever the trade VLA. said, VLA, we've already opined that VLA, VML, VACO, there are trade associations. They're not, so when you go there, even though the public sends you to go there too, they're not meetings under FOIA because you're not talking about the library board of Appomattox County. You're talking about library stuff generically but if three or more of you get together and say we really like what we learned today why don't we sit down at lunch and have a discussion about how we can apply it in our locality how many people think you're beeping at that moment because you are <coughs> do you ride in a car together when you carpool what are you talking about three or more so again two by two okay all right let me get this question then i'll come back right we have people Three working days before the date of the meeting. How? In a prominent public location where notices are regularly posted. So newspapers. Uh, newspapers so or po sticking on a tree on a bulletin board. It's a physical world still posting. Um, they, you get to decide where your prominent public location is, and you train Website. people to look. Website. Website is in addition, you cannot only post on the website and not have the physical posting because my Greek mother, you tell her, oh, it's on the website. <laughs> you tell her, I love this in this group, you tell her, go to the public library and get online. <laughs> Say what? That we still live in the straddling world. So do not put on your website and think you've made notice <coughs> under FOIA's requirements because it requires physical posting. So it has to be published three days before the meeting. Right, so if the meeting's on Wednesday, you don't count Wednesday, it's Tuesday, Monday, Friday, the and notice has to be published. Well, the paper and the text of it and the yeah, and it doesn't, and don't FOIA <laughs> doesn't require newspaper publication. <laughs> FOIA says post it, but if you choose to put it in the newspaper, then keep doing it because you've trained people to look for notices in the newspapers. And you know the papers, since their business is going down the tubes, would appreciate the revenue. You know, um, <coughs> bulletin boards on the front door of the library, because you get to train them where to look. If you want to know when the library board meets or the advisory committee, this is where you come. You can call. You can probably look on a website, but physically it's going to be posted right on the so front doors of the library, or if there's yeah, a message place. So that's good enough. On that's the, good enough. Right. Okay. And if you decide, if you know four days in advance, you could be with two other library board members, and you all are going to talk about it. Put it up, and then take minutes of your meeting. Yeah. Have to take the minutes. Right. Because if you have minutes. Have a meeting, you have to have minutes. Exactly. Now, the only exception to that rule is if. <coughs> the subcommittee or whatever is not a majority of the board, you don't have to take minutes. It's still a meeting, it has to be noticed, open to the public, but if a majority of your subcommittee, 